of on the fly and see how we do. If when you're going through the uh, listening to the lectures, if there is something that you think that you would like for us to break out, uncover, do some investigating for you, then just send it to cco.us forward slash topic hyphen request. That's where we got these questions is exactly from the topics request. So feel free to do that. The giveaway, great fun. We enjoy giving away and giving back to our community. You can uh, pick three things. You can either get a year of the CCO Club Basics, which we're going to talk about more uh, about the club here in a little while. You can have an hour session with one of us, or you can get one of the review blitzes. By far, I think everybody now grabs that mm -hmm. club bundle because it's the best. A lot of perks in that club. Not sure how many graduates we had. Did you peek at all, Jennifer, to see how many slides of graduates no, we have? They're not that many. Probably not going to have. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, they're not testing because of COVID. They're just starting to work on doing some remote uh, proctoring and everything. So if you did recently pass or you wanted to let us know that you passed a certification exam, please, it's easy to let us know. Go to cco.us forward slash past the exam. There is actually one slide of people. Oh, yeah. Okay, good, good. And these are people that have put oh, it in since okay. our last webinar. So some of them are a little bit older, but they're still new to our community. Yeah, yeah, okay, great. So it looks like we had recent pastors, Heather Lynch uh, and Lisa Wilson, both passed the CPC. I'll do those first, so you can do the next mm -hmm. two. And then uh, on the right, it tells you the products that they use from CCO to help them pass. And again, if you have any questions about these products at any time, let us know. And we had somebody who passed their CRC, their risk adjustment exam, that's Charity T. And then Christopher O'Dell passed the COC, the outpatient coding exam, using a couple of the products we have, like the blitzes, both of them used. So I think you have the COC, don't you, Jennifer? No. No, 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 you don't. Neither one of us have that, but C -O -S -C. I got the CRC and no, yeah. oh, that's COS. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Well, good. All right, we are now ready to get started to the meat of everything for the June Q&A webinar. Oh, for our new people, just so you know, we do this every month. We call it our public webinar, and it's the second to the last Thursday of the month. We have a lot of fun doing this. Okay, so I will start with the first question that we had come in. And of course, during this time, we may have some downtime right now. So this person said, you know, during the pandemic, they wanted to use their time that they're waiting for more education, which is always a great thing to do. So now they're getting kind of interested in ambulance coding. So they just wanted to review some information that we use for coding or billing uh, ambulance services. So while I'm waiting for that sheet to come up, um, using uh, the different programs that are out there, and pretty much you can find anything on the internet right now too. So you know, if you're interested in something, always go out and um, search for it and find some more information and say, hey, yeah, that does look pretty interesting. Maybe I will find out a little bit more about that. So there are just a couple things to look at when you want to go into billing when you're getting ready to bill for a new type of specialty or new type of service. So for ambulance services, that seems kind of unusual because maybe not everybody covers ambulance services and not everybody takes an ambulance, but ambulances transfer people from from a car accident, from a home, from a hospital to another hospital. We also have air transport as well. So as we move down, the most important, I mean, most insurance carriers, you're looking for the necessity. So why does somebody have to be transported via the ambulance? And it's typically not just because their car broke down and they can't get to the doctor's appointment. That's a little bit too far. So um, most of the time, 
the records need to document this information. That's one thing that's very important that we know from coding anything is that record documentation. That's true in ambulance services as well. They still need to record all this information as to why, what the status of the patient is and everything. Um, and then even there's different types of equipment that's available on the ambulances and the types of services they do, as well as what happens if the patient deceased while the ambulance is on route somewhere or before they even make it there. So there's a lot of information out there available about all these different little scenarios. So transport services are covered to the nearest appropriate facility, as well as a return. And now I'm looking at CMS guidelines and I like to go there first because as we know, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services handles approximately about half the insurance out there. So, and they are a good guideline for these rules for just about any per service or procedure. So there's different types of covered facilities that will cover ambulance services. If they're from a hospital, a critical access hospital, CAH, skilled nursing facility, which they may have some additional criteria for Medicare, a patient's home, or even a dialysis facility for the patients that have end-stage renal disease. So, but it's not covered to or from a physician's office. Now you may see them come to a physician's office uh, because, you know, if the patient came in and that physician, to primary care can't handle because it looks like their EKG says they're having a heart attack, they're going to call the ambulance and transport them to the hospital. That may not be covered. So for Medicare, they're typically billed under the Part B services, which are our medical services. But if their patient is considered inpatient, then it's covered as a package service with the hospital. So it depends on the entity, it depends on where they are, such as the inpatient. A skilled nursing facility could either be Medicare Part A or Part B, or like we said, those critical access hospitals. So it kind of depends on where they are, how things progress in that transportation. You can have ambulance by air. Uh, if uh, when either the basic or an advanced life support, and I'm going to go over that a little bit, the difference. Um, is not appropriate. So in case you're not a pilot or an aviator, the fixed wing and rotary wing. So we have an airplane, fixed wing, rotary wing, helicopter. So you can transport a patient in either type of air mode. Um, they can be covered because of course, as we know, it could be quicker. If you live in a heavy city, have lots of traffic, so there's an accident at four o'clock in the afternoon on the DC Beltway, it's gonna take them a long time to get to the hospital and they may have to call an air ambulance instead. Um, or if it depends on their illness, it depends on how traumatic or emergent that, or that situation is, that they need to get them there a whole lot quicker than even if the highway was open. Or if you're a remote area, Hawaii, Alaska, um, way out in the countryside somewhere, um, covering a great distance, or if there's a lot of obstacles in the way, hills, mountains, construction, things like that, they may opt for an air ambulance transport. So why is somebody medically able, reasonable, or necessary to have ambulance services? CMS lists a couple of these things. Insurance, other insurance carriers may have more. They may have their own rules or guidelines, but like I said, CMS is a good place to start. Um, intracranial bleeding that requires neurosurgical intervention, uh, cardiogenic shock, burns, Need, that need to be treated in a burn facility, um, conditions that require treatment in a hyperbaric oxygen unit, uh, multiple severe injuries, you think of a, a major motorcycle accident or something, or any kind of life-threatening trauma. Uh, those are very good reasons to have an ambulance come uh, and transport you to a facility. Some of the requirements that they say for ground transportation could be time-based. So determining whether you need ground transportation or air transportation could be, and this is uh, straight off of CMS's uh, the website, as a general guideline, when you take the ground ambulance 30 to 60 minutes or more to transport a patient at the time of pickup when it's really urgent, then they may call for a different type of transport and that would be acceptable. 
you can go hospital hospital so they get transported to our hospital and then they say well we we don't have the services here in our local hospital to handle that we need to transport you to another hospital so air could be appropriate if their life is in danger um, or they could send you via an, an ambulance say um, 22 weeks into a pregnancy and they don't have an EQ, so they might just transport you via ground to another facility. So there's also different types of ambulances and medical providers aboard those ambulances usually. So we have what we have BLS, basic life support. Those are typically, and these are different per state guidelines, but typically they would be staffed with at least two people which of course makes sense, one's got to drive and one's got to help somebody, who meets state and local laws um, with at least one staff member who's a certified EMT. So that, that's typically, states could be different, but that's typically um, how they stay at basic life support. At the advanced life support has different levels. So advanced life support one or life support two. Advanced life support one requires somebody who has advanced life support personnel training a, another level than just a basic EMT. And then there's also advanced life support too, that the worker, the EMT, we will say the technician and the ambulance are able to perform multiple services. So the equipment on the ambulance, it can, you know, they're looking at endotracheal uh, intubation. I don't know how many EMTs can do that versus somebody who's specifically qualified to do that. Um, and then there's all sorts of other levels that they talk about on the CM website. So if it's something you want to dabble in or there's an opening in your area for ambulance support, there's a lot of information and I have included the link on the CMS website to learn a little bit more. At least that would give you a head start before you start a new field. Of course, one of the biggest hurdles in all coding is modifiers. So modifiers is very important when we're billing for ambulance because the modifier, we, modifiers are all two digits, right? They could be numerical or they could be alphanumeric or they could be a mix of, you know, or they could just be number uh, alphabet. But in ambulance services, this is how we tell that story. Think about a modifier 25 when we add it to an ENM service. We're telling somebody, the carriers or somebody, that we're telling them more about the story. There was another procedure in addition to an office visit or, you know, a, a modifier 57 or 66 or any of the other modifiers that we typically know from procedure codes ambulance as well. This is how one portion of the modifier tells us where they came from and the other portion of the modifier tells us where they go to. So you put these two characters together and we come up with our two digit modifier that we append to our ambulance claims. So we have did they come from or go to a diagnostic or therapeutic site that's not a home or physician's office. Was it hospital-based ESRD facility? Was it a hospital? So we can see all of these different letters indicate something different. So if we did SH, we went from the scene of an accident to the hospital. That's gonna be our modifier on t along with whatever um, HCPCS code is going to describe the service. So if it was an institutional based, some hospital facilities or some institutions have their own ambulance service. So if they have their own, there's another modifier so they can use two modifiers on the claim. Um, or if it's something that they arranged, then there's another modifier. And it didn't all fit on this other page because it was a, a snip um, off of the CMS website. So if we scroll down a little bit more, we'll see all the HCPCS codes. And these are the HCPCS codes that identify our ambulance service. So we would say um, ambulance service, basic life support, emergency transport, A0429 with the SH modifier. So they did uh, emergency transport, basic life support from the scene of an accident to the hospital. So that's kind of how these codes are put together. Um, I do have the 
link for the CMS website, and it's actually all in the manuals. So there's a manual for ambulance. And then how to complete that CMS form, so we know what goes in which field, that's in the second manual there, chapter 15. So ch chapter 10 is strictly for ambulance. Chapter 15 is for uh, billing, how do, how do we provide all the information in a CMS form. So there is just some good information to figure out. We need to kind of know a little bit of background of the types of ambulance services that there are, the types of equipment that's on these services, the mileage, if it's by air or by land, and they have water transport as well. And so there's just, you know, a lot of information that we need a lot of details, which comes down to our documentation. So again, everything needs to be properly documented so we know how to code for it. You always have such great stuff. <laughs> So much well, Alicia can give more background on that, huh, Alicia? <laughs> Working in an ambulance, talk, huh? I, I've gotten to talk on a few, a few things, but yeah, mm -hmm. the, the paperwork that you have to fill out so that they can mm -hmm, get those. I I've done that. It's not little. Well, yeah. I'm ready for another poll. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, how does the company you work for handle workplace diversity? got a well uh, scale of one to ten with one being bad and good being ten so workplace diversity and maybe you can put in the chat what uh, workplace diversity means to you yeah good point it's much good more one. than just just racial right um, there's a lot of diversity out that's there. right and mm -hmm. I'm not gonna get in trouble by identifying specifics so uh, whatever is important <laughs> to you, what does that mean? Just the, just like Alicia said, put it in the put it in the chat because we want to uh, encourage people to celebrate our diversity. I think someone nicely put it. I did a, a big race amity celebration yesterday and had a few thousand people on the live stream. And uh, one of the things that I loved in one of the comments that was shared by one of the community members was diversity is like like. Uh, playing music one note just sung by itself is pretty boring but when you have harmony that is sweet and that's what diversity is all about i love that i love that and you know what sometimes when you listen to the orchestra or you listen to beethoven or bach or mozart and you can pick up the different the strings the winds and and everything awesome mm, nice. i'm going to close the poll here in about five seconds we got a lot of nice nines or tens, so if you want to share some of those companies that you work for that are doing a good job, we'd like to celebrate those guys. So put those in the uh, chat yeah. or the question box. So I'm going to close the poll and share the poll. So bad job, 6%, a little bit better, 8%. 5 to 6, that's about the medium, I guess. You would say 22%. Yeah. 7 to 8, 20%. And 9 to 10, 45%. So basically 65% are doing a pretty good job. So congratulations, guys. Good. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Nice. Barb said Optum's got good diversity. Yes, they did when I was working there too. Nice. So, great. Thanks, guys. I suspect I get to go next. Boyd Probably. scatters us out. Pretty. Boyd's having to work really hard tonight, guys, so you're going to have to get him some kudos. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Oops. Poor, poor I hit, fella. The, hit the wrong key. Hold on a second. It did something strange to me there for a second. Okay, go ahead. So this particular topic came in to our forum, and it was a question about coding traumatic Foley lacerations is how would a urethral laceration due to traumatic Foley be reported? And they did a great job. What they did was they went to coding clinic and they compared, they said in coding clinic, 2019, page 23 and 24 discusses injury due to traumatic um, uh, intubation, endotracheal intubation and it's dead to code k91.72 accidental puncture laceration complication code so would this complication code that's what they're referring the cc to be applicable for a traumatic foley well actually you're very very close now this doesn't only happen to people who are new to coding but we have to think about what we're documenting and why we're 
what is actually going on. Okay, so we have an injury. The injury is due to what? Well, you kind of you kind of get lost with the word trauma. It is trauma, but you're not going to be looking up trauma in the index. So I broke it down how to look it up in the index. And you go to complication first. And that is actually how you got that K code. But the reason that this is an N code versus a K code is that the digestive tract is all K codes. So think of like Kellogg's Special K, you eat Kellogg's and it's good for you, for your digestive system, right? Well, we're doing the gentle urinary system. So therefore, the codes that you'd used for that would be an N code. So think of, um, uh, usually we think of renal, but ENCODE is where we're going to be working. So look up first complication in the index. Then we're going to go to intraoperative. Now intraoperative also means procedure. So it says intraoperative and then in brackets you'll see procedure or intra procedure. And putting in a catheter is a procedure. Then what happened? We have a puncture or a laceration, but the key is it's accidental and unintentional but what did the laceration where did it happen and anatomically where did it happen gento urinary organ or structure and then it it ends again during procedure on so it tells you the code in the index to go to is n99.71 Gento urinary organ or structure. Now I went ahead and put N99.72 because that's other procedure. So you could pick either one. Honestly, you could probably justify either one. So either a gento urinary system procedure or other procedure. Uh, so just decide within uh, your office which you feel put the procedure of, of placing a Foley catheter would fall and and then just stick with it if you have to code it again then you'll be okay now this is that's really all you have to do however I couldn't leave you there so I went and found some cases the first case I found of course I got pictures for this one this is actually an abstract so uh, what was different is that it's not common to have uh, any type of urethral lacerations without trauma, usually to the pelvis of some type. And if there is no trauma or uh, pelvis being broken, fractured, something like that, then this is very unlikely. And that's another reason why that code is hard to find. So this was a case, it's a little bit different, but this would be what it would look like if we were doing, we were catheterizing a female and then there was trauma. So that actually, that gray that you're seeing is the Foley catheter going into the urethra, okay? And then that's actually a laceration. But this is a little bit of a different situation. It was uh, due to her straining. She had colitis and some other things. And she actually uh, lacerated the uh, urethra. So they're outside and inside. And there's a picture of when they scoped her, the, another laceration. So external laceration, internal laceration, not due to the Foley. So this is a different situation, but it can be done. This is extremely rare. And that's what the abstract was about. So if we scroll down just a little bit more, I wanted to um, show you, they actually did a CT scan to show um, if you see that hole, that's where the, the trauma occur occurred. That's the laceration that we saw in that previous picture and then you can see the cold uh, the foley going up there now i thought eh, again you're not going to find this very often with females however with males i did find this story this abstract another study and this is where you could have had, this is where the scenario might have come from. Uh, we don't know. We don't have enough information from the person who sent the, the question in. But this was an abstract. They had a 68-year-old male that had urinary retention. So 
when they go to the ER, what do they do? They cath you, and then it drains the bladder, and you get released. Uh, and then they'll if then they go in and try to figure out why we had urinary retention, and it could be a kidney stone. It could be all kinds of things as to why they would have this. But we had a problem because this was a student that cath them, and they admitted that when they put the catheter in, and if you guys aren't familiar with how they do that, it's a tube, so they put the tube in, and they want it to stay in the bladder, so then there's a balloon, actually, so you insert the, the, the Foley catheter, the tube, and then there's a syringe that you put in air or saline, depending on what, what type it is, and that little bulb blows up in the bladder, and then it can't be pulled out. Okay, now this is not a quick cath. That's where you just stick the tube in. It's got holes in it and it drains. This would have been a cat. They want it. It's called an indwelling catheter. And the the um, student admitted because the patient had pain, they had problems. And when they tried to do it, that said, you know what? I don't think I got it all the way in there up to the bladder. I blew up the bulb in the urethra. Okay, that's not going to work, right? We're going to cause problems. And um, ultimately, they took more scans and they looked and everything and and he actually did get it up there to where it needed to be but it was a study he ended up having a diverticuli in the urethra and that's why there was retention so there was a complication and and everything but if you do not put in the catheter correctly you're going to have you could have a laceration especially on men uh, versus women Okay, so that's it. I and and I put the links on where you could s read those abstracts. Really good stuff, fun stuff. So look up complication. Mine went really fast. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever gone that fast before. <laughs> I know, I know. I was like, ah, I and you even had pictures. pictures. Wow. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Hey, we got a sell, guys. Mm -hmm. Great fun, a summer sell. Uh, just go to cco.us forward slash summer sale, and it is going to expire Saturday. That's June 20th at midnight, 30% off, and you can get it off the courses of the Blitz. I have been watching the chat, and I noticed that uh, we have some people that are interested in courses. You can go to cco.us, look at uh, forward slash courses, and be able to try to figure out if you can't figure out which course would uh, be best for you, feel free to send a message into helpdesk at cco.us and we'll walk you through it. Uh, we're pretty good about being upfront and honest and saying, mm, if this is your end goal, then this is probably the path you need to take. Uh, or, you know, I've done that quite a few times and I know Jennifer's done that too, talking to students like, mm -hmm. you think, you think you want to do this, but you know what? This might be a better way to go. And and plus, we want to save you money, right? <laughs> We've been there. We know. Always. Yeah. So check out the sale. I just saw that sale sign going June 20th. Wait, I know June 20th. Wait, that's my brother's birthday. So I had to write myself a note to ah! a birthday card. <laughs> kind of forgot about that. Good for you. <laughs> this last week was my brother's birthday. Oh, I mean, with, you know, with our dates right now, who knows? Uh, we're all off. So we had a question come in asking for some insight on a PRP injection for major joint injections. And this one was dealing with the spine. There, of course, they give an example of a shoulder injection. Um, I'm wondering if the coding is correct. Uh, PRP injection is something that, you know, I'm orthopedics background. And so we did PRP injections often. So um, the proteins that are in the body, they produce what we call growth factors. And the growth factors help our wounds heal. So I mean, just imagine how the body works. Everything in the body, how it all fits together and how it all works together. So the platelets that are in the blood, of course, they form clots when we're bleeding, like a wound, or they can also aid in repairing and regenerating that tissue. Um, those contain growth factors. and the proteins that the body makes. So a PRP injection, or what we call a platelet-rich plasma injection, PRP, it's called, it's been called many things since it came out in the late 90s. They've actually been doing this a really long time. Um, 
it's growth factor, GEF. There's a couple different names for it, a couple different abbreviations. It typically right now is uh, PRP, platelet rich. This gives that high concentration of platelets straight to the injured area. So it can work much more quickly as a pain relief and healing that area. So, you know, everything, you take a Tylenol, it has half hour, 40, you know, an hour before it takes effect because it has to go through the whole bloodstream and filter out everything else in the body, go through everything. Well, that's why these PRP injections can be so valuable because they go straight to the wounded area. So they take a sample of the person's blood and then they concentrate those platelets in a lab. Typically, it's in the same area. They have like a little centrifuge and the little, you know, they, they spin out all of the bad blood. Think about how they make milk. You know, they, they spin it so that the lesser stuff comes on top and the heavier stuff's in the bottom, right? So those platelets are then, they take them out and then they inject them back into the body. So it's your own plasma, it's your own platelets. They're just what they call harvesting them. They're just making them work a little bit quicker. So we can go down a little bit more. So these are typically done by orthopedic surgeons. Um, we've done them in the elbow and the knee and the spine. You think of some areas where you have like tendonitis, bursitis, things like that. But when we deal with coding, yes, and it's an, it's an injection. And if you look up injection in your CPT index, you're going to be going in the musculoskeletal section, maybe integumentary section, nervous section. There's injections all over the place in our CPT book. So trying to narrow down what kind of injections they are, which always comes to our wording, which that's where the bat technique helps a lot, that bubble and highlighting. So a 20610 is an arthrocentesis. So an injection centesis in the joint. Arthro, arthrocentesis, or an aspiration. So it's either an aspiration, they're pulling something out, or they're putting something in, that major joint or a bursa. So that's just one code I chose. Whoa, well, okay, we're injecting. We could be injecting straight in a joint, right? Maybe we're injecting something we've aspirated and we're injecting. Why can't I use a 20610? 64483, an injection of an anesthetic agent and or steroid. Well, okay, we can already cross that one out because we're not doing an anesthetic agent or steroid. So we could be doing an injection in the back and the transferaminal. Um, it could be doing something like that, but we don't have that anesthetic agent or steroid. So the proper code actually is a category three code. So if this has been around since the 1990s, why is it a category three temporary code? you'd think we should have a code by now. So 0232T, it's temporary code. An injection of platelet-rich plasma at any site, it includes the image guidance, harvest, and preparation. Okay, so that's what we're doing. We're taking out the plasma, we are harvesting it, we're going through that centrifuge, we're pulling out what we need, and we're injecting it. So it's an injection of the plasma. So it, this can be done while you're doing another surgical procedure. So do we bill for an O232T along with some kind of knee arthroscope or spinal surgery? No. And this pulled straight from a reference that I have for you. Um, and this is a direct quote. The best reference is a 2009 CPT assistant where it says the placement or injection of the cells into that operative site is inclusive component of that procedure performed and not separately reported. So that injection we did, anything we're putting back in there, it's, it's part of that surgical procedure you're doing. So we wouldn't bill for that. We can do a PRP injection in the office or in an ambulatory surgical center or a um, outpatient facility. Now, it can be done in any of those three. It's a sterile technique. All, you know, all those things are met. All the qualifications are needed. But an insurance carrier may, if they're going to pay for it, because remember, it's category three code, they may not all cover them, may pay for it if it's done in a facility, an ambulatory surgical center or an outpatient facility. So granted, we could do it in our office, but for an insurance carrier to pay for it, they might want it done in a facility. 
but we have to read those CPT guidelines because it says, well, okay, real quick, um, that reference I had was from uh, Brian Cole, MD, he's a doctor. This is his um, paper that he that he wrote about it. So it's actually out of um, a Cengage paper. So um, there's a link straight to it. A lot of good information about it describes it, uh, what a PRP injection is and things. But remember, we got to look at those guidelines. We cannot report 0232 with 20550 which is an injection, 20551, 20926, 76942, ultrasound guidance, because remember, it's already included in the wording, 77002, all those other types of codes, 86965, that's a laboratory. So we're not going to, it's already part of the harvesting, it's already part of the preparation, and injecting it back in under some kind of guidance, those are already all included in the name of the code. So that's we need to keep in, in mind our um, coding guidelines. So what about billing? My field, what I love. The category three code is all inclusive. So the providers took it out, they harvested it, they spin it up, they get it separated, they prepare it, and then they re-inject it. They do that injection and possibly use guidance. That all comes in that description. So we can only bill that code. This procedure can also be done in multiple spots. They call that peppering. Um, think about shaking pepper, you know, shaking your seasoning. They take little spots here and there. Even though they did it in five different spots, it doesn't matter. It's all one code. So we don't bill 0232T five times. It's just once. Um, coding, we need to remember to follow CPT. So if something doesn't accurately describe what we're doing, we can't just guess, oh, well, that's close enough. Or maybe they really did that and I don't know, it's just not in the notes. So I'll just use that code, you know, the guessing game we sometimes play. We can't do that. So we can't say, well, it's just like a 20610, we aspirated it and we injected it into a joint but we didn't do everything, so I'll just modify it and say, I didn't do everything in that procedure. Think about billing a, um, colonoscopies. Remember, if we don't get all the way to the end, we bill it as a reduced service. Well, this isn't a reduced service. This isn't minimal or more uh, difficult to do. So this, uh, there is a code for it. We can't just make up our own codes. And I know we all want to be nice to the patient and sure this would really help you. I'll bill a code that your insurance company will pay for. Well, we can't do that either. So we can't just pick a code and say, oh, I'll just send it, I'll just say it was a, an injection, 20610, and then they'll pay for it. Well, for one, that's shortchanging the doctor. You're fraud, you're not billing the services that were actually provided, documentation doesn't match, you know, a whole lot of red flags go up there. We always like to be nice, but, you know, some carriers might process this claim if it's for chronic non-healing wounds, but tendinitis, that's not going to be, you know, that's not a chronic non-healing wound. So um, that's what they consider investigational. They're going to say, well, you got to show me more evidence as to why that would work. There are HCPCS codes out there for the chronic non-healing wounds, but an injection in the back or the shoulder or the knee is not because of a chronic non-healing wound unless they have one on that area. But that is a platelet-rich plasma injection using the phlebotomy, the centrifuge, the preparation procedures, all of that. There is a HCPCS code for that. But it, remember, read the code. It's specifically for chronic wounds and ulcers. So, and then that P is for the platelet-rich plasma. So we often get this question in orthopedics, and I touched on it a moment ago. Can I just bill something else and just make the patient pay for it? Well, I'll just bill an injection, a 20610, because I'm really injecting it but I'll make the patient pay for the rest of the, the kit, the packet, the procedure. It comes with, you know, the tubes and all that stuff and the time of the person there who's running the centrifuge and everything. We call it a kit. It came as a PRP kit. 
And well, I'll just bill this and then make the patient pay for the kit. Well, not all insurance companies may allow that for one. And again, you're not billing properly. It's not proper coding techniques. So uh, we can go down a little bit more. And the answer would be no. So can I just bill for an injection and just charge the patient for the, well, probably not. No, because it has a CPT code. And what's the most important thing that Alicia says, I think every single time she does a webinar and we touch on often, coding is for statistical purposes. How are we ever going to get 0232T out of a temporary code if we're not reporting it to let the insurance carriers and the administration and all the all the people involved know how often this code is being used. We want to make it a real CPT code that could be um, used by insurance carriers and covered and things like that. So we, it's not really right to do it the other way. We want to code properly. And statistically, we want to show how many times this procedure is being performed. Now there was, if you're interested from the insurance perspective, if you do work in a clinic that does these PRP injections and you want a little bit more information, this is a Primera Blue Cross Blue Shield information that they came off with, but I have to tell you this is the best information I have seen about PRP injections. It is so detailed with all sorts of information and if you've ever read any of the medical um, the MLNs from CMS, they indicate every time something's changed on there and then they reference the previous um, article. This has so many articles referenced for different ways of doing PRP in different areas. Now, granted, you may not be in Primera Blue Cross Blue Shields area, but it's a good resource to use and then maybe you can cross-reference your own area and your own insurance carriers. Um, so it's a good uh, thing to look at and granted it's from 1998. So they have other information up through 2020 about PRPs, but it was a good source of information, very detailed. So if you do do PO PRPs, um, remember that we do need to submit those codes. It will be denied by the insurance carrier. Most likely we can call and try and get authorization for it, but we do it for statistical reasons. So that's why we need to stick with those codes that are out there and code it properly. Sorry, that was so Aww. long. <laughs> Thank you for that. She listens to me. She hears me say of that. I do. I say it almost every time. <laughs> Why do we do this for statistical <laughs> reasons? I can even do the motion. <laughs> uh, oh, right. This is this is a fun. This is a fun question that came in. I really uh, was glad to see it come in because. We often talk about the tables in the ICD manual and the neoplasm table gets most of the education, the most of the, um, well, the, the, the time, right, that we talk about. But the table of drugs and chemicals, you know, it, it, it really mirrors the way that the uh, neoplasm table works however it is different. So uh, this question came in, can you help me with the table of drugs uh, uh, and chemicals? Because uh, I'm a student, my instructor at college, uh, I went, it went through it so fast and I don't think I'm getting it. My friend suggested I ask CCO about it. Good friend, <laughs> we appreciate that. Yes, this is something that can be confusing. So what I did was I did this in two parts. The first thing that you always want to do when you're, you're working with ICD is go see if the guidelines give you any direction, and they do. So I copied this from the guidelines and even highlighted just like it states in the guidelines. The first thing that we're going to be looking at is adverse effects, poisoning, underdosing, and toxic effects. And these are going to be codes from T36 through T65. So that's the first thing we need to know. 
Now, uh, there are guidelines that when you look at these codes that tell you other things that will be documented that you need to code for. Why? For statistical purposes. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we do is tell yourself, do not code directly from the table. And that's the same with the neoplasm table. It's really hard not to fall into that habit of flipping through, looking at the code in the neoplasm table and saying, okay, I got it. But if you're testing, that's going to cause problems. And besides, if you're testing, you're just going to be using the tabular anyway. So don't code strictly from the table of drugs or you won't get the guidelines that tell you the additional codes that you need to do. Um, also, use as many codes as necessary and there is usually, there you'll never code just one of those T codes. There'll be multiple codes uh, that you'll need to, to explain what is happening and it's a, it's a story that you're telling. So uh, again, uh, you may even have the situation where more than one drug or chemical was used. So therefore, you have to repeat it to tell the whole story uh, more than one code. All right, so then what's the next thing the guidelines tell us? They want to know if there is a cost, uh, a cost of agent. In other words, uh, something that burns on the way down, like an acid, that's what that would be. And uh, if that is the case, then they're going to want to know about the reaction that it is having. Not only did we poison, but we've caused damage. You, you've probably heard like poison control. There's some things that if a child swallows something, you don't want them to throw it back up because that means the acid is going to come back and burn again the um, the esophagus. So uh, that's that's important. If you have more than two drugs or more, again, or the biological substances, whatever, there sometimes is a combo code that you'll see in the table that because those are two co two drugs that are commonly used together. Or if that's not the case where you don't have two codes that you could, uh, the, the description explains the two, then you're going to need to, to uh, do it twice. So code for the first substance and then code for the second substance. And that means you're probably going to have to use the additional codes that are applicable for each one. So again, one scenario, you could end up with multiple codes from the table. If you have and multiple unspecified codes. Now, this is just rules that come from the table, how to use these. Uh, then there is a special code T50.91. And these, when this happens, what I like to do is write that at the top of the table so that if I'm going through and I'm looking and it's like, oh, yeah, that's right, there's that T50 code. T50.91 and that it's an unspe it's multiple unspecified drugs. This may happen when the person comes into the ER and we just don't know. The blood work hasn't come back. We don't know what the person's ingested or or why, frankly. So tips. The first tip is don't code from the neoplasm table. The neoplasm table is like the index. It's the launching point. It's where you're going to start the process to get to the highest specificity. Okay, It is a guide to get you there. Terms are key. So we're going to talk about all of the terms, just like in the neoplasm table. Remember, we start with primary malignancies, secondary malignancies, then we have the benign, then we have cancer in situ, or it's cancer in situ, then benign, and then a couple others saying we don't really know what it is. We need to know what those rows mean. And then the next thing is you really got to know your drugs. And it, you're not going to have all of these memorized, so you need a good reference point. And I'm very fond of drugs.com because it's easy to remember. So that's a place that I would bookmark on uh, your computer. It's easy, drugs.com. I think there's even an app you can download from your phone. If you're going to do a search, okay, now I just went ahead and copied what find a code 
shows the table to look like when we start with one drug. And uh, we're going to break this up because I know this is a little small, but uh, what we do is the first thing you're going to look up is the drug. That's why it's important to know what's the drug. Well, this I pick opiate because that's a common one that gets used. So just an opiate, an opioid. Uh, so that's the drug. But then notice here we have multiple things. Now I've broken this down into a, a little bit bigger of a graph, but this is what it's going to look like in your encoder. And this is what it actually looks like in your manual if you go to the table. Okay, you're going to see that it's an opiate and then you're going to take your finger across and it's going to tell you each one of these sections will give you the code. Now, this isn't the final code. You see that red flag? That's telling you that you need additional characters. Another reason you never code from the table. So not only are the additional codes you need to tell the story not in the table, you don't know what additional codes to code because it tells you in the tabular and there's additional characters that you need. So if we scroll down, I kind of made this in my own little table uh, to make it uh, a little easier to see and it's how my brain thinks. So again we start with the drug and I picked an opiate. It's the easiest uh, one that I could think of but the reason you have to know this is look at the different opiates. So we have morphine, oxycodone, hydrocodone, hydromorphone. Those are all classified as opioids. So if the person took an overdose of oxycodone intentionally, then we need to know that that's an opiate. Uh, we also need to know that uh, not just that uh, that drug is an opiate, we have barbiturates, we have, uh, well, there's just a whole list uh, to go through. So way, one of the reasons the table is advantageous for studying is that you can go look at the table and then you could look at all of the drugs over on the left of the table in your manual to say, oh, wow, you know, I, I didn't even think about that drug, right? Uh, but remember, you have great resources like drugs.com. And if you just don't know, what you do is you type in what is oxycodone in Google and it'll pop up and says it is an opioid that is used or it's a synthetic opioid, blah, blah, blah. He's like, okay, opioid, that's where I need to start, right? So you have lots of resources at your disposal. If you're testing, they're going to give you that information, okay? So what do we start with? Our drug. And then here's the categories. We have accidental. Now, I'm going to explain what each one of these means, but I also typed that out for us in the description so that you'd have it written out. But first thing is accidental. Uh, let's say the patient has a prescription for oxycodone because they had their wisdom teeth taken out. Now, a little tip, something personal. I was born without wisdom teeth. Just thought I would share that for you. <laughs> Lucky me. Uh, sorry if you had to had your wisdom teeth taken out because you usually get that done in your late teens, right? Early 20s, that becomes a problem. So patient had some oxycodone or some hydrocodone and they accidentally took too much. This is this actually happens. Uh, this happens to me when I had surgery. I no longer, my husband no longer lets me have pain medication at the bedside because I lose track of time. So I was like, oh, I could take two. So I take two, I go to sleep. Two hours later, I wake up and, and I think, even if I look at my watch, that it's been four or six hours when it's only been two. So I think, oh, I can take two more. So now I've had four in two hours and then you sleep two hours and you're just like oh I can take two more so again you could accidentally very easily overdose on pain medications so if we have an accidental uh, poisoning because that's what an overdose is it's still classified as a poisoning it's important that you know your terms t40.2x because it's a placement marker one Okay, now notice I put the dash there. That means there's more characters that you need. And I put those other characters down there for us because they're not in the table. We have initial encounter is an A, subsequent encounter is a D, and a sequela is an S. So 
if the patient comes into the ER because they've accidentally taken too much oxycodone, because they'd had their wisdom teeth taken out and they did what I do and they, they're not paying attention, then it would be an A initial counter, T40.2X1A, right? If this is a subsequent visit due to the accidental ingestion, then it would end with D, okay? And then S is light effect. So now we have accidental explained. The next thing you under, need to understand is intentional self-harm, right? So around the holidays, people get depressed. Maybe um, they're upset about COVID or whatever. I don't know. Think of your own scenario. They intentionally take too much hydrocodone, right? Then it is T40.2 times 2, okay? It wasn't an accident. What they did was they purposely intended to harm themselves, and therefore the code is going to be that uh, two. And if it's in the ER, the initial counter, same thing. It'll be an A, D, or S. That's the full code. We only have seven characters. Assault. Assault is uh, explained in that, let's say that um, my husband just got fed up with me complaining too much, and he gave me four uh, uh, hydrocodones instead of two, and then two hours later, he let me have four more. Okay, that's assault, <laughs> right? They're purposely giving this to you, and uh, it could, or maybe somebody injected you with something. I mean, you come up with all kinds of stories, and actually real life is, is crazier than fiction, but one of the tests that I used to give my students, the book had one that was assault, and it was uh, a drink at a bar spiked with snake venom. Who would think of that, right? That's classified as an assault, so if we uh, purposely give somebody too much morphine, that's an opiate, it's a salt, T40.2, uh, and that extra point in there is not supposed to be there, X3, and then it would be, again, A, D, or S, okay, a salt. Next, undetermined. The patient comes into the ER, we don't know. We know that they've overdosed on um, hydrocodone, but they're unconscious. The family doesn't know. Did they accidentally? They they had no indication the person was upset about anything. Uh, so so we don't know. Maybe they had an allergic reaction to it. We just don't know. Uh, we know what they took, what what they ingested, but we don't know why it was ingested. And so uh, T four zero point two X four. That four tells us it's undetermined, and uh, then it's A, S, or excuse me, A, D, or S is our last character. Then we have adverse effect. Now, adverse effect, this is the one that gets confusing because uh, uh, we don't want to confuse underdosing, accidental, and adverse effect. Adverse effect means I took the medication as prescribed. The doctor intended for me to take, you know, one of the hydrocodones for my surgery every uh, six hours, okay? And when I did, I broke out into a rash. Um, I had trouble breathing. They rushed me to the ER, come to find out I'm allergic to uh, hydrocodone, okay? I'm not, but... Let's just, you know, that would be an adverse effect. The key to adverse effect is that it was taken as prescribed and it was prescribed correctly, okay? So you don't have to overthink it. It's just that something adversely happened to the patient when the substance was ingested, all right? So that's a five, T40.2X5. And then we have our A, D, or S. Okay, now underdosing. With underdosing, it could be a couple things, but usually it is the patient isn't taking the medication, enough of the medication. They're underdosed. So it could be the fact that the it, that we've got an opiate here. Um, 
they they said the doctor said you need to take two of these uh, hydrocodones for uh, pain relief. Okay, every four to six hours, and the patient says, mm, "You know what? I'm really nervous about that. I don't want to get addicted to drugs, so I'm going to take one, but I'm only going to take one every 12 hours." Okay, they've underdosed themselves, and you think, "Well, what? what how is that a problem?" Well, if they need pain relief to lower their blood pressure after a procedure was done, they've underdosed themselves and it's gonna cause complications. I actually did this once. I had a kidney stone removed and I had to take care of the kids. And so I didn't take the pain medication as prescribed. Um, I was taking a whole lot less and less frequently. And what happened? My blood pressure went through the roof. It was like 210, and it was 200 over 110. And I started having, uh, it sounded like someone who was squeezing my throat. They finally ended up calling the ambulance and I ended up back in the ER uh, and was back in the hospital for two days because I wasn't taking the pain medication ultimately is what I wasn't getting good relief and it was causing problems with my body. So that would be a six. So that's T40.2 X six A D or S. Okay. Now that gives you an exclamate and an, 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 an not exclamation <laughs> that tells you what each one of those columns means. And you have to, those are your key terms. So you have to know the drug. Oh, it's an opioid. Um, and, or, you know, so is it, is it going to be an accidental? And you're going to get this whole thing for every single drug. That's why there's so many of these codes, code choices. So uh, again, T40 was a poisoning for an opioid. And then the two stood for accidental. And, uh, and then I, I went ahead and just typed out what each one of those mean, but we've already talked about it. So we can scroll down uh, pretty far, probably Boyd for them. And if you're in the CCO club, oh, right there, go up just a little bit where it has that yellow bar, uh, right there. If, um, if you're in the CCO club, you'll have access to this. I did see that someone asked about that. You'll you'll have access to listen to us, this whole recording again to the presentations. Plus, uh, we have it transcribed. And in addition, you get the slide deck, but only club members get that. So there was a special note that went with uh, these codes and it's non-compliance. Now that is not underdosing. Don't get those confused. What that means is the patient is not taking the medication correctly as prescribed, okay, or they're not taking it all. So, so you could have said mm, underdosing, maybe it's because I was 300 pounds and I should have had a 500 milligram and I got a 250. That would be underdosing, right? Uh, but if the person just says, I'm not taking any of my medication. That's non-compliance. So there are other codes that uh, you can use, and there's also complication codes. So the non-compliance codes are the Z codes. Do not use these codes unless the, document the documentation tells you specifically that they are non-compliant or that there was a complication of care that, that caused them to fall into one of these scenarios. And that's it. This is fun stuff. And you will be tested on it uh, for for any of the credentialing exams with any organization that you choose to, to credential with. I thought you meant yeah. by the end of the night, there's going to be a test. <laughs> yeah, well, I would give you one. <laughs> a celebration of knowledge. I had a professor that used to tell me that's what a test was. I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> None of us agree. Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> until until we become instructors and then we do that. Yeah. I have a beautiful <laughs> hang, don't I? My nose is dirty. Uh, oh, right. Now, what Boyd does for us is he pays attention to the feedback that we get uh, and the testimonies that we get. And we and he's great about making sure that they're current. And we get a lot of current ones. We don't pull one out from 
three years ago. These are ones that come in routinely. So we appreciate your feedback and letting us know how CCOs helped you. Um, but we got this one from Heidi G. Thank you so much. The BAT system really helped me and so did your time management techniques, which talks, which is in the BAT um, and also in the blitzes that are on sale right now. I stuck to them until the end, even when I started to panic and passed. And let me tell you, when you take a six hour exam about halfway through, mm -hmm. I think it's part of it, it's like your blood sugar and you've been sitting there for three or four hours, you do start to panic, no matter how much you know the information. Um, and so again, there's a lot of great testing tips in the bat technique to help you. Uh, you can get that when you purchase the blitz. And if you purchase a course, the blitz comes with it. So, hey. So thank you, Heidi, for that. And you guys can go look at other testimonies at cco.us forward slash testimonies. Testimonials. I have to spell that right. Also point out the CCO proven process. I think that's an important one. <gasps> you know what? You are mm -hmm. right. That That's a good point, Boyd. Um, you know, and I did see some of the questions coming in, especially people that are new. The proven process is a step-by-step uh, process that Laureen started out with that first what you do is you know you decide your career path right what you want to do and then you have to decide where I'm going to go to school so education is important on the proven process it's really step one uh, whether you get your education through us or you come to us after you've gotten your education and you need those testing tips that we talk about so uh, the very first part is you know get your education so come to us or wherever you go uh, learn the material number one two you're going to use the techniques like the bat technique we have those in our the blitz somebody asked about you know well what's the blitz go to cco.us and it'll tell you what the blitz is uh, or you can go to the proven process here it uh, has the uh, key concepts the time management that everybody mentions, uh, the bubble and highlighting, which is the bat technique, how to mark your manual so that you save time and you get to the highest mm -hmm. specificity quickly with your codes. That's step two. Step three is uh, testing, I think, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. Yep, practice exams. So you're going to practice, practice, practice. And we suggest that you keep taking practice exams until you're getting 80, 85 percent uh, routinely. Uh, we believe in this so much that we've created free practice exams that you can get through us. And then you can also use our paid. We've got three for, I think, almost every credential that mm -hmm. we teach. Uh, and that's step three. It's to make sure that you're confident going in, right? Oh, and then pass the exam, take the exam. That's the last step. And then you go back to the testimonial page and you tell us how you did <laughs> and what worked for you so that we can share that with everybody. Thanks for mentioning that, Boyd. And I think Jennifer's next, right? Yes. So, like I said, you know, in the community, in the forums, we get a lot of questions that come in, scenarios from your job or, you know, or something you've questioned about in your studying, perhaps, and, and wanted to know which scenario would work best or which codes you feel, do we feel that, do we have the same opinion? So we actually had two different questions. I felt that kind of dealt with kind of the same thing. We've actually had a lot of um, hospital claim questions come in lately, so I thought I'd try and tackle two of them. Um, so they're dealing with discharge of different levels. So the first one is if, if a patient is admitted and then discharged on the same day, they were told you could bill the code range of 99234 to 99236 if the same doctor admitted and then discharged the patient. Well, what about if one doctor admitted and another doctor discharged the patient? Then is only the um, HMP, the history and physical or the evaluation by the admitting doctor billed with the um, codes 99218 to 99220. And then the discharged doctor doesn't get to 
do anything. Is that correct? Um, the second one is dealing with um, transitional care management codes after a discharge. So um, there's a window of time to build these codes and certain things must take place. So what code do we bill if a patient comes in after that window of opportunity? So I'm going to start with question one and we'll go down a little bit. And the um, for the admit and discharge on the same date, there's some rules for that. So there's a requirement that you have to have at least eight hours in, in between the time that they're admitted. And this is not, I came into the ER and I've been there for eight hours because that happens to all of us, right? So this is, they were actually admitted. Either they're admitted into observation or they are admitted as an inpatient in the hospital. And then it happens to be that at least eight hours passed and they said, you know what, those test results came back. It really is, whatever the case may be. Yeah, you're, you're good to go. And then they discharge you. So how do we bill that? So there is, if they have to have at least two encounters, they have to see them at least twice in that time, in that eight hours, at least eight hours. And you can build that family code range of 99234 to 99236. And remember, documentation is key here. We have to prove the documentation that they're admitted, that they saw them, and, and you know, all, all the lovely things we're supposed to be keeping in the records. So those codes describe the attending physician or other kind of non-physician practitioner admitting the patient to either inpatient or observation and then discharging them at least eight hours after they first encountered them or saw them, admitted them. So what if it's less than eight hours? What do we bill? Okay, well, Medicare, and I like to use them, I'll say it again, because they're a good gold standard, all right? And they usually provide this kind of information where a lot of the other carriers don't. So that's why I usually go to Medicare. Um, they suggest that you only bill then the initial encounter codes for either inpatient or observation, but not discharge. So you can bill if eight hours haven't passed, okay, I can't do the admit discharge code, I can do the admit code. Um, and, but what if the patient's admitted for inpatient hospital and then discharged on a different date? Well, that's they can report the inpatient hospital and then the discharge because they're two different dates of service. So clearing that up, there our question was, this is one date of service, two doctors. So with two different providers, so if we go down a little bit more, if our two doctors are of the same affiliation, uh, they same tax identification number, same practice, you know, just guy A works in the morning and guy B works in the afternoon. Um, then only one is receiving that service charge because they're all billed under the same tax identification number. So they meet that qualification as if it was one provider admitting and then discharging and they had that eight hour break in between and everything's documented they can use that 99234 to 99236. But what if you're in a small rural town and Dr. A admits, Dr. B discharges on the same day and they're in competing practices. They don't, they don't work, one's a contractor, one's not a hospital employee, whatever the case may be. What if they're from two different entities and it's the same date of service? So if the requirements were met for that eight hour time frame, and they did that two visits within that time, you cannot bill those codes because they're of different entities. So what can we bill? The initial care codes per CPT are listed as, it says initial hospital care per day is the exact next phrase, per day. So this is all in one day, it's the same day. So we can only do one of those codes in that one day. So which only allows one person to bill for that evaluation and management or HMP. The admitting provider would be best to submit their charge um, for the reimbursement if their documentation is sufficient. That's suggested because admission typically has a higher revenue um, than the discharge. There's typically more documented. There's uh, typically a better reimbursement rate 
Um, so the admit is usually the one. Now, another scenario on the billing side, well, okay, I'm gonna bill the discharge instead because this doctor wants to get paid. Well, the, if you send a discharge code into the insurance company, they're gonna look at it and say, well, where's the admit code? And then they may not pay for other services in between perhaps because they only know the patient's been discharged. They were never actually admitted. And they may not pay a discharge if there's no evidence the patient was ever admitted. So it's usually, uh, you think about it logically and on the billing side of things, you're gonna admit the, you're gonna submit for the admit code. And documentation, we have to meet those requirements. There are certain requirements for all of our inpatient. You know, remember, they gotta meet the three criteria and whatever's documented for whatever level it is they're going for. And so the answer to our question would be what CPT leads us to is per day. If we can't bill that same day, then we're gonna go with the per day code. That would be your hospital admit code then because we cannot bill a discharge and an admit on the same day unless it's that specific family of codes that is specifically for hospital admit and discharge on the same day. Now question two dealt with transitional care management. Now CPT has a whole page plus some on guidelines for transitional care management. So that's a lot of important information. I kind of condensed it right here in this first paragraph. There's non-face-to-face -face requirements that can be met by your clinical staff or the provider. And then there are face-to-face -face requirements that need to be met in order to bill for these codes. So it, they break it out even more than this. I kind of condensed it. Some form of communication with the patient electronically, phonetically over the phone, telephonics, or actual person coming into the office. A home health agency, some other kind of community service you're trying to establish for the patient. If you're doing any kind of patient education, caregiver education, how to use certain devices, things like that. Um, to establish referrals, well, okay, now they need to go see a physical therapist and they need to go here and they need to go there. I'm gonna get all those referrals arranged for them and possibly even set up those appointments for them um, just for ease of purposes to get everything done and scheduling their follow-ups. Now, transition care management is actually a 30-day code. Um, it begins on the date of discharge and it continues for the next 29 days. That's when you can bill these transition care management codes and there's two of them. So there should be one face-to-face -face visit within timeframes that are indicated by CPT of either seven or 14 days in combination with those non-face-to-face -face services that could be done by a provider or staff, those scheduling the appointments, the referrals, patient education, and that's all labeled out in CPT. You can bill additional e &M services during that 30 days provided they've done that first face-to-face -face visit with the patient. So that's reported separately. Say they come in, they came in at their seven or 14 days and now they're coming in at day 25. Well, that can be an E&M visit that's allowed. The transitional care management should include um, interactive contact with the patient. We need to, and you're, not, you're not just leaving messages. This is interactive. We're talking to the patient or their caregiver. Once we find out they've been discharged, okay, so I'm Dr. Jones, I'm the PCP for this person. They want me to coordinate all this care. They've been discharged from the hospital and they're putting them under my care. My, my office has been notified on Friday evening that this patient was discharged. By Tuesday, by Tuesday I should be in contact with that family or that patient and getting everything set up. You need to come in, you need to do this. We, we need to coordinate this for you. So within two days of discharged from the hospital setting or skilled nursing facility, and they label out all these hospital settings for you in CPT. The contact can be done by the doctor, by a non-physician practitioner or the clinical staff. So they need to be reaching out and, and establishing contact. The purpose is to address the status and their needs, not just to say you need to come in for a visit. We need to see how you're doing. What, what do you need? What's going on? How can we um, 
accept this. And now there is one, and I've left the footnote of the information of where I found this from. Um, so if two or more separate attempts are made in a timely manner, you're continually trying to follow up, but you're unsuccessful and other care management criteria have met. You've tried contacting them, you've done patient education, you've done these things, but they're just not, you know, some of that non-compliance we talked about, you haven't come in for that face-to-face. -face. The service can still be reported because you're doing everything you can. Now, the transitional care management includes all the services that are outlined in CPT, like I said, um, during that 30-day discharge. But if the patient, uh, if we didn't bill one of those codes, but we've met the history, we've met the physical uh, exam, and we've met the medical decision making, we can bill another E&M visit because it meets those guidelines. If the patient is readmitted into the hospital again, then our transitional care management 30-day timeline is gone. We, we can't be following up with them again because they're back in the hospital. Now, transitional care management is described as new or established patients whose medical and or psychosocial problems require moderate or high complexity medical decision making during their transition from inpatient to a community setting like their home or, or another type of community setting. So we can understand how important these things are, why we can't just let somebody slide off of, these are people who have severe problems, who might have um, tried to self-harm. They, they could be, you know, a lot of different problems. These are high medical decision-making. Just think about anything that's um, classified as high medical decision-making process. Those are people who are need of immediate life of life and death surgery or something like that. So very high decision making on the physicians. So we really need to follow those visits and really make sure that those patients are coming in. So some carriers, and Medicare is one of them, some carriers out there have said telemedicine meets that face-to-face -face requirement, especially right now during COVID. Did I lose? You did, but we didn't lose your audio, so you can continue. There you go. You're I don't back. know if You're I... Back. You're back now. I'm still going, but the uh, American Academy of Family Practitioners also laid out that information as well. It's a really great website with a lot of information on it. Did I... Did you get any of that? I think we got it all. Yeah. Did you hear us? You hear me? Probably not. Alicia, you can come back on if you're... Is yeah, it good? I was going to say, no? I yeah. think she's struggling there. <laughs> yeah. She's coming and going. You're good. You're good. You're good, <laughs> Jennifer. I think we got everything. How far did you get? <laughs> I think we got it all. Did you hear us now? No, I think you got it all. Yeah. Did Alicia, you get it? Yeah. Yeah, we got it. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. No problem. Um, I kept saying it's gone, and I didn't know if it was really gone or not. <laughs> we heard your audio, so you're, you're fine. So especially now during COVID, this does meet the telemedicine requirements, but it actually, you still don't have me. <laughs> yeah, we got you. Oh, okay. It actually has been a telemedicine requirement for some time. So if you cannot get that patient in the door and you're wondering what else to bill, you can still bill for your attempts for the service, or it would default to the ENM for whatever services you are able to perform for that patient. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> what a trooper. It's usually me. I figure <laughs> I'll just keep talking. So, yeah. <laughs> your, your voice didn't cut out. It was just the video that, that cut out there for a minute. Next. We got another poll coming up, don't we, boy? If I look. Yeah, actually, I'm going to jump around here. So it's 9:30, and this is when we normally announce our winner. So we'll come back and finish up everything. Um, so we do have a winner. Did you hear about that, Alicia? No, I I didn't bring that up on my screen. You'll have to tell them who it was. I'm sorry. <laughs> She's she might Boys be lying be be like because it's a really talks. hard name to say. Okay, sorry, Tony. 
Buon Figalo, I believe, is her name. And and we were all oh, laughing in the CCO the chat, waiting for Alicia to, to kind of oh butcher gosh. her name. She's excited. She's excited. <laughs> oh, I was going to see. It was coming up. Yeah. Wow. Usually when the person that gets drawn, I don't ever see them. Uh, you know what I mean? I'll think, oh, maybe I saw that name. But that's a name I saw. I was like, oh, that's probably the first time that's happened. Good for you, Tony. Awesome. Okay, Bo- great. Oh, Buona Figalo. So we're going to go backwards now okay, a little bit. Okay, so what bit. you're going to do, Tony, is you are going to um, pick, if you want a Blitz video package, you can have a year of the CCO Basic, uh, or you can have an hour session with one of us, and not Boyd. He doesn't do those, <laughs> even though he's doing all the work tonight, right? And um, uh, again, if you have any questions about that, you can let us know, but... Uh, please send a message into it helpdesk at cco.us. Let them know that you're the winner. They will have your name. And so they ex- will be expecting a message from you. Yeah. So we're we going to do, do a poll? Yeah, point? why not? We won't we'll do it very Are you long. a member of the CCO club? Which Tony may get to be a member of the CCO club if that's what she picks. Uh Oh, good. This is a good poll. I like to see how many people are here tonight that are part. So, yes, you're a member. No, I decide not to not join at this point. Or no, didn't know about it. Is it important for my career? Well, the answer is yes. <laughs> so, so let us know. And you can start talking about it while we finish up the okay. voting here. The CCO Club, let me tell you about it. If for since we have so many new people here tonight, uh, the CCO Club, uh, what it allows you to do is every time we do webinars, we do recordings. And I mentioned earlier that uh, it's transcribed. Uh, on top of that, uh, the video is kept in the club and you're able to have access to the slide decks that are the answer sheets that uh, we have as part of the presentations. Uh, We do several presentations a week, not just this monthly presentation that you're a part of tonight. And uh, that's just part of the club. That's one little part. So that's the content. You get CEUs too. We don't just do like a half CEU or one CEU. We bundle them up so you can get three, five, 10 CEUs at a time. And it's fun stuff. It's really pertinent to your testing or your everyday coding needs. Um, It's about billing and coding and practice management and compliance and so on and so forth. Uh, So you get a lot of extra product support as well. Brian asked a question actually about the CCO club. He said, are there AAPC CEUs available on demand, like viewing previous videos that we could watch for CEUs? Or is it only one video CEU a month going forward when you join? Mm -mm. I can't remember how many is in there now, but I think there's over 80. And you can pick and choose the topics that that are applicable to what you need. So let's say you've already tested, right? And you need CEUs uh, for a, a specialty credential that you have, uh, cardiology. Then then there there's some that are approved for that, and also a HEMA. So if it's approved for AAPC, it's approved for a HEMA. Um, and then we've got other. Uh, let us know what credentialing organization you're with because we are most likely approved through for them as well but we'll help you find out and clarify and you now you get a taste of our personalities so you know what type of uh, lectures you'll be listening to uh, so you'll listen to the lecture and there'll be a quiz that will verify that you uh, watch the lecture and then that's all you do it's instantaneous. Uh, real easy to find, cco.us forward slash club. If you go there, you'll find even more information and, and actually a video de- describing the club more in depth. We do a lot of videos. <laughs> We're visual learners, most of us. Oh, so this is a question that came in. Uh, when do you code R79.89, R74.8, and uh, R94.5? Can you give some examples of when you would use each of these codes? I understand why this is so confusing because some of the terms, these are all labs uh, and they're abnormal labs. 
that's why I titled it Cohorting uh, Abnormal Lab Results. So these are the ICD codes that are attributed to abnormal labs and they kind of cross each other. That's why it gets confusing. And when I was looking at it, I was like, oh, wow, yeah, I can see that um, that you might look at the lab and think this is the one that you're, you're needing when in actuality it's one of the others. So what I did was I divided it up. The uh, first two, the R74 and the R79 codes, they fall in the range of abnormal findings on examination of blood without diagnosis. Because if you had a diagnosis, then you wouldn't use these codes, right? So uh, again, both of those codes are going to fall in that range. The very first one, uh, R74.8, the, uh, the code for that is abnormal levels of other serum enzymes. And you think, well, okay, that's not so confusing, but the word enzymes is what ends up being uh, problematic because you're going to see that again in some of the other codes. So it is for other serum enzymes. And when you look up the code and you go to the tabular, I made it in a smaller font, but this, you know, acid, uh, phosphates, uh, you know, uh, this lipase, they all fall under that category. So whenever you see you know, those uh, indented under the code. It's other serum enzymes, including these that are listed for you, okay? Then the other code was R79.89, other specified abnormal findings of blood chemistry. So what's the difference between one for serum enzymes and blood chemistry? I'm going to break that down for you. Now, the third code that they asked about was actually in a different area, okay? And you can see that because it's it's in R90 through R94. And what's really beneficial is when you go to the tabular and you look at these codes, if you just go backwards and see what the heading or the range is, sometimes that'll help you clarify which is the proper code to the highest specificity. So this range for this last code is actually abnormal findings again on diagnostic imaging and in function studies without diagnosis. So this is also going to include, uh, this is studies, but not all studies are imaging and function studies. Not all of the, some of them involve blood, obtaining blood, right? So and as you're going to see, all three of these kind of cross each other. So let's explain in more depth. Just note, R94.5, abnormal results of liver function studies. Now, I did highlight this excludes because you have to remember with all of these, they're without diagnosis. Okay. So you are going to exclude diagnostic abnormal findings classified elsewhere okay even though it's diagnostic it's we don't have a finding okay it, this is abnormal we got more testing is ultimately what this means so let's divide them up i made little tables for you to reference so if you're in the club you're going to have access and you can use these again and again so they're all blood tests they're all without diagnoses right and um the what makes each of these it different is that they have different purposes. The first one, R74.8, the serum enzyme. Whenever you see that one come through with an abnormal study, it's telling you, hey, we need more testing. What serum enzymes does is it lets you know that there's something wrong with the liver. So keep that in mind, liver. It's either inflamed or it's damaged because it has elevated serum enzymes. Anytime you see that serum enzymes, then you know they're, they're checking the liver. And uh, when it's an abnormal test, hey, something's wrong with the liver. Now we, not, we need to know what it is. We have to go do more tests. So what are they gonna do? They're gonna pull a blood chemistry if they haven't already done it. And it's a pretty basic, 
test. So it's not uncommon to do a blood chemistry as well as the serum enzyme if they're thinking there's something wrong with the, the liver. But what a blood chemistry does, the R79.89, it is going to check for these things. It's going to check the electrolytes, the fats, the proteins, the glucose, and the enzymes. Ding, 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 enzymes again, right? Told you you're going to see these words again. And that's where it gets confusing because you think, well, I thought, I thought this other test was serum enzymes. Well, it is, but serum enzymes checks for the liver. But there are enzymes that check other organs. So whenever you have enzymes that are abnormal, that means that there is an inflammation or damage being done to an organ. A lot of times it's the liver, but we also have other enzyme tests that are done that show that we have problems with the heart, that the heart is working too hard or it's not getting enough oxygen. Okay, you'll see enzyme studies. So any type of abnormal enzyme, the key word with enzyme means organ. There's a problem with an organ. So we need to find out what the problem is. So when it's not just the electrolytes, the, prote the, the proteins and the glucose. So if we have elevated glucose, we're spilling sugar, right? Uh, proteins, too much proteins. Remember, if you were pregnant, they checked your urine for what? Glucose and protein. Because if you're spilling protein, and it's, a lot of times it, it's an organ struggling, but often it's the heart, okay? but it could be the liver, right? So those two tests are trying to see what's wrong with the liver or one of the other organs. It is like a baseline. Then we get into the liver function. So that first test that you saw, they gave us the serum enzyme that said, hey, something's wrong with the liver. It's either inflamed or it, you know, something's wrong. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna go do further testing we're going to compare the blood chemistry, but we're going to do this liver test. And that is going to tell us a liver function study, a higher specificity. What is making the liver struggle? Is it high triglycerides, meaning we have really high cholesterol so the liver can't filter? Is it diabetes? That really makes your liver struggle. And you, people may not realize that. High blood pressure. Again, the heart is working too hard because and that enzymes will reveal that. So the heart and the liver is struggling. Why? Because our blood pressure is too high. So our liver is struggling. Or do you have anemia? Anemia can also have uh, uh, make your liver inflamed or have liver complications. So this is the reason for each one of these tests. The first two tests are, you know, the 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 one in green is pretty standard uh, they're trying to figure out what's wrong you know uh that that blood chemistry that's tells us the components of the blood what's running around in the blood it's going to give us a right direction to go but if the doctor suspects there's something with the liver they're going to do a blood chemistry and they're going to do a serum enzyme and that's going to tell them hey uh, that there's a problem with the liver and then they're going to go down and do that liver function study they are 94.5 to get more specificity to see okay what is what's making the liver struggle so again we're talking about the liver multiple times we're talking about enzymes multiple times and they all kind of read the same right they sound like they're the same but actually they're not the first two or the the one in green is not as high of a specificity it's like a warning sign and then um, the serum enzyme hey it's the liver. It's not the heart. It's the liver that's a problem. And then we go to the R94.5 liver function study. This is fun stuff. And again, if you're coding, why do clinicians make great coders or people that have been in the medical field? Is because they, they kind of know this stuff already. So any exposure that you have, even if maybe you had illnesses or people in your family, you've been caregivers and you've looked at this information, you're going to be aware of it and it will make some of these codes click for you a little better. Yep. I like to say good stuff every time. So uh, we'd love it if you guys would take a survey that was in there that lets us know how we've done. Do we have any questions come through in the, the chat? 
Did we get a few? I think so, yeah. All right, so this isn't stop Alicia and Jennifer section, but the webinar is over. Thank you guys. And um, uh, Tony is saying, I'm sorry, I don't know where to locate, where to sign up for my prize. Tony, send a, an email and it's going to go to helpdesk at cco.us. Very easy. Helpdesk at cco.us. We'll find us there. Uh, let's see. Ooh, this is an ENM. I'll read it and Jennifer can answer it. <laughs> okay. If a patient comes in and it has an IND, an incision and drain, um, and is performed and comes back two days later, and the IND is performed again a day later, each time the requirement for ENM were met, good, okay, the IND is done on the same spot, okay, what can be billed for the th for the three visits. Okay, they did it three times. Uh, three times. This is performed in an urgent care facility. Now, I I kind of know what um, <laughs> Jennifer is going to say, but this is exactly the type of situation that is real world. They're not going to give you a question like this in a, in um, testing because it it's kind of a you know, it, it, they're going to they're going to make it a much easier to test on this. But this stuff happens in real world. Mm -hmm. So what what yeah. say you, Jennifer? <laughs> well, the big thing here is and this is what is not on a test is getting into a lot of the global periods. So we did something a little while a couple weeks back about global periods as well. So in, a, in our procedures, we have minor procedures and major procedures. Minor procedures that are done have typically a 10-day global period. I and D can be 50-50, depending on how deep it is and things like that. Uh, it could be either uh, a zero-day global period, meaning you can come and have it done every day. That's fine. Or a 10-day global period. Yeah, a big period. boil or a cyst under your yeah. armpit in the axillary that, area. Yeah, it that's means if they keep what's coming like back, all the care within 10 days of providing that procedure are all included in that IND code that you're going to bill. Doesn't mean they can't keep coming back, but if they come back and they read you the IND, you need to add a modifier um, because you're probably doing a little bit more each time they come. You're going to do a modifier saying that um, they returned. But the ENM you don't bill for in a minor procedure. That ENM, that office visit, that urgent care visit, whatever code it is you're going to be billing out of the 99 evaluation and management section is already included in that EN in that IND procedure code. So yes, great, please meet the ENM requirements because <laughs> you have to document why you're doing it. That meets some of the medical necessity. Okay but we don't bill for it because it's included in the procedure. Now, if it's something that happened the day before surgery, it was urgent, we had to do it, there's a modifier for that. But typically, especially if they keep coming in like this on the billing end, you can't meet that e and every, every time within four days and a procedure. Because remember, if you do an e and and a procedure on the same day that have to be separately identifiable. They came in because they had a splinter in there, it's causing this big rash and infection. Okay, you assess them and you said, there's pain in the finger. Well, now I'm doing an IED to take the splinter out. But if they come back again, because it's still causing problems, it's still for that same reason. It's not separately identifiable anymore. It's now, well, is coming in because the IND is having a problem or complications are not separately identifiable from a procedure, especially in a minor procedure. So INDs can be minor, they can be major. It depends on how deep you're going, but a lot of them are also don't have any global period, which means they're covered in a evaluation and management. You don't need to build a procedure, they're covered in the evaluation management. You can find that information on CMS's website uh, or any kind of, um, it, it's uh, the NCCI edits. No, I'm sorry, it's fee schedule. Um, or a lot of um, encoder programs, find a code, other programs will tell you what the global period is of that IND code you're using. So, 
Probably a long way of saying that. <laughs> no, but it makes sense, right? I think. Um, and like I said, this is not what you'll be tested on. You will be tested mm -hmm. on global days, but you're not going to have a situation. They're not going to test you on a situation where the patient comes back three times. This question, actually, we already answered. It was my, uh, the one I did for discharge. So. Okay, good. Good. So we can skip that one. Just reference back. Home health mm -hmm. billing and coding. Oh, I can help you a little bit here. Mm -hmm. um, it says, so I've been given the opportunity to do some home health billing and coding, but I'm having a hard time finding information on how to code and bill. I have experience in primary care. Excellent. That will be beneficial mm -hmm. to you. So I need all the help I can get. Where can I get more information to help me have a success in this new field? There is actually a credential for home health uh, coding and billing. Uh, however, it is not with AHIMA and the AAPC. Uh, what happens a lot of times is that uh, with a coding, they want somebody who's OASIS certified to kind of do, unless you got a really big home health agency, it sounds like you're working with a little bit bigger one to be able to do this. Uh, because, because to fill out an OASIS, you have to uh, be a clinician. You have, you have to be an RN to be able to fill out an OASIS. Needless to say, you're going to abstract your codes from the OASIS, which is like a 17 page document uh, that is filled out by the RN. The RN is the case manager. They fill all this out. And then someone in the office, usually not the RN, takes all of that information, puts it into another document. And then that document is sent off to the provider. The provider okays and says, yeah, I, I agree with this plan of care. And then it comes back and then it's coded as you go for, and it's done every six weeks. So the reason I know this is I got to do it. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, it There are both uh, CPT and uh, uh, ICD codes and HICS-PICS codes. Now, not all home health is geriatric Medicare patients. Uh, home health can be done for all age groups, depending on, you know, so so you may be dealing with Medicare, which a bulk of it is. However, let's say you have a child that has had a uh, kidney transplant and uh, they've got a wound not healing on their back and they need a wound back and they don't need to be going, they, it's difficult, they can't get back and forth. So home health comes in and does the, um, the education for the caregiver, uh, monitors the wound back, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe they get home IV antibiotics, all that stuff could be in there. So you can't trust yourself to just use chronic condition codes that are common to geriatric, uh, you're probably going to need to know ICD very, very well. And you did primary care, so you're a good suit for this. Now, to answer your question, where are you going to find good training? Uh, there is a couple organizations out there, and all you have to do is go to Google and put um, home health uh, coding and billing, and uh, uh, they'll help you. They'll put you in because I can't say that one is better than the other. If you are certified, you have a CPC or one of the HEMA credentials, the CCS, you will have what you need to be able to do this, but you're one of an experience. Now, the AAPC just released a course. It is not a credential. It is just a course on home health billing. Um, I can't bet it. I haven't vetted it. Um, it doesn't look like it's very long. It's going to give you an overview of what you need. And so I would say that's where I would shop first. Uh, it looks like it was very affordable and it could, you know, you could get through it very, very quickly. Uh, again, I haven't vetted, so I don't know the content, but I know that the AAPC and AHIMA both have been for years, people asking, come out with a home health credential and it's kind of supply and demand with them. So um, I would say that that's where I would check first is it is a class. It is not it's like a boot camp, I think, is more. Isn't that what you think, Jennifer? Have you looked more yeah, into it? Yeah, just, just a, you know, just like a, what, like a workshop kind of thing. You know, it just right. all the information you need to know. So yeah, yeah. The other and one I just went to, coder, as you were talking, I was, was already a coder. 
then yeah. then that would probably be all you would need. But uh, Jennifer said she looked one up. So, well, That's while you were talking, one. I just do my normal one, which is home health site colon cms.gov and i go straight to cms because especially home health you're dealing with a lot of medicare not always it's like alicia said but, and there's a lot of information right there um because home health has a prospective payment system they could be Correct. part of a patient protective prospective payment system which now you're talking icd 10 pcs so there's mm -hmm. you know a lot of different information out there it talks about the 60-day requirement you're billing for a 60-day time period um yes. you know based off the information from the doctor and medical necessity and things so yeah it it is not something that i don't think you could oh pick up to start billing it you do need to find your no. resources so yeah definitely have a and couple resources on hand yeah um then let me tell you the coding is actually very easy it's oh, yeah. the billing yeah. That's the hard part for, for, so if you're doing coding and billing, um, there is, the thing about home health is back in the eighties, it was a huge hit and it was a way that you made really good money quickly, uh -huh. uh, honestly offering services that were, were needed. So it was this, so we had all these mom and pop companies that, that opened up. However, there was tons of fraud and abuse. And because there was so much in the 80s and in the 90s, the, the late 90s, the restrictions and the Medicare, uh, your home health is constantly, constantly audited. And we're talking big, big bucks. So uh, the billing aspect is where you want to make sure that you are top notch, uh, mm -hmm. get some peers in there to, to resources and like you said cms is going to be your go-to place but but as far as the coding aspect that's really not hard not hard at all yeah yeah in 2000 they went to the inpatient pers or to the prospective payment system which kind of bulks yeah. and that's what we're talking about you're billing for that six weeks 60 day bulks yeah. the money together so yeah and and you want to make sure that you always um more so than in like inpatient where you know how like you're pay, paying attention to the drgs and stuff like that that's really heavily done uh, mm -hmm. on home health mm -hmm. you want to make sure that if they have you know um that you're getting the diabetes and that's the first code that's being listed and not you know ingrown toenail <laughs> or something you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> last question uh, and i think yep. it's good so we all wanted to keep it um we're at 10 o'clock okay. but let's do it hi I'm new to this webinar. Yay! Uh, my question is in the demand in the future for medical coding jobs because I want to join medical coding training in the future and start a new career. Can you please explain? You know what? We've got some great videos on our YouTube about this, but we also have resources on the uh, website. So if you go to the cco.us website and um, go to freebies uh, over on the, well, I think my camera is, it's upper left hand cord. Cor I started to say quadrant corner, uh, go to freebies and we have some books that uh, we've created and you'll be able to get some information about that. Uh, also, feel free to write into the forum, join the club if you want to, but you can also write into the forum. More than happy to, to ask answer questions more specifically for you, uh, but it's it's really growing and there's some areas that are in higher demand than others right now. So. We'd love to tell you more yeah. about it. That's always been a concern that, you know, our jobs will go away or robotics or, you know, automated system. Yeah. But who writes the programs? Who has to double check the programs? Right. And not everybody uses a program. Audited. And, you know, there's auditors, there's all different yeah. levels. So, yeah, the experience can grow into something, you know, that mm -hmm. you wouldn't even think of right now. So, yeah. Boyd found that uh, on the website, I think you saw where you went to freebies and you scroll down to the bottom, free reports and handouts, how to become a, a certified coder. All this stuff is free. So just just download it. Um, uh, but that one right there is a, is a great one to start with. Yeah. And if you're interested in the courses, just go to courses there uh, and look at the different ones. And there's full explanations with videos that can, that can help you um, uh, get started. Look, even more free articles. We give a lot of stuff out free.
we have fun with that. I think that's it, guys. I think so. Yeah. We did good. <laughs> Even with all the technical issues and, and everything, <laughs> I got a new computer and I told Boyd I got in late today and then I told him like 15 minutes before the webinar started. Oh, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Thanks, guys. It's like herding cats. That's what we like to say. <laughs> <laughs> with Alicia, he's been working lovingly. with him for a decade. It's like he knows. Yes. He was like, "We have thirty seconds," and and I'm like, "Okay, well, I can move the screen, or I could do that." He goes, "Can I go do my hair?" Seconds. Keep it as it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> we roll with it. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Especially if this is your first time. We really appreciate you being with us tonight. And again, a lot of these resources you can find at cco.us. Don't forget about our YouTube channel, which. A lot of these videos is mm -hmm. their evergreen home. We're nearing 4 million yeah. views, as I just showed you just briefly there. And we look forward to seeing you next time, same second Thursday of the month, end of the, before the end of the month. And we're going to be doing another one. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Go find us out on LinkedIn, too. We're, I think we're mm -hmm. all on LinkedIn. Feel free to do that. And and um, uh, I've been mm -hmm. I've been kind of away from LinkedIn for the last couple of weeks. So, uh, YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. That's where we spend yep. most of our social media time. So be safe out there with COVID. Don't forget to wear your mask. Don't take those. Don't don't let that. Don't be fool licking you. any doorknobs. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Okay, good guys. Uh, sorry, I've messed up my live stream. It kind of looks funny now. All right, so there we go. So uh, have a great Poor evening, boy. a great week, and a great life. We will see you again, I'm sure, in our streams and everything else, I hope. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Peace out. <laughs>